Welcome everyone and um, welcome to this year's March of the Living Limud session. We are delighted today to be joined by Dr Agnes Kaposi who joined us on our programme in Poland in 2019 and has been an inspiration to work with ever since. Agnes survived the Hungarian Holocaust and went on to live a successful and fulfilling life which she writes about in her recently published book Yellow Star Red Star with historian Dr. Church. The concept of this collaboration is unique and I can't wait to hear more about the significance of their partnership. Um, I'm going to hand over to Agnes and Dr. Church um, in a second, but there will be um, time for questions. We'll be taking the questions um, via the chat feature. I won't be unmuting you unless you very specifically want to speak. So please, throughout the presentation, add your questions into the chat and I'll hopefully um, be able to propose as many of them as possible towards the end. So without taking any more of your time up, um, I'm going to hand over to the wonderful Dr. Church, who's going to um, start our presentation. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is very hard that I cannot see uh, any of you. Um, and it's, uh, of course, a very different uh, uh, circumstances uh, speaking like this. Uh, first of all, please uh, let me uh, just uh, briefly summarize the historical background uh, uh, of this book. Uh, I'm sure, of course, uh, you know a lot, but uh, just the basic uh, uh, facts to, to remind us. Um, I think we can, we can start with the slides. Uh, so, as we all know, Auschwitz is probably the most widely known universal symbol of genocide. It is a less well-known fact, uh, however, that one-third of the victims of the death camp arrived from a small Central European state. The iconic photos of the Auschwitz album, uh, which you see now, uh, depict Hungarian Jews who arrived in the Jewish ramp during the spring and summer of uh, uh, 1944. In March 1944, some 750,000 Jews living in Hungary represented the largest surviving Jewish community in uh, Hitler's Europe. Uh, and with the imminent defeat of the Nazis, they had good reason to believe their sufferings uh, would be over soon. However, Following the German occupation of Hungary that very month, the Nazis and their local accomplices deported about 450,000 people from the Hungarian provinces to the Auschwitz-Birkenau camp complex. More than 300,000 people, mostly women, children, and the elderly, were murdered over a period of just 56 days, making it one of the most uh, efficient uh, genocidal campaigns in history. Despite the brutal efficiency of the uh, campaign, uh, time and other factors actually worked against the Nazis and their accomplices. Therefore, they could not complete their genocidal project. Although in extreme sufferings and losses, the about 200,000 strong Budapest Jewish community and many Jewish men who performed the slave labor for the Hungarian army ultimately survived the war. In early 1944, traveling to Budapest from the provinces or vice versa became a matter of life or death. My friend and co-presenter Agnes was 11 years old at the time. With her parents, she joined the extended family in Debrecen, which is a provincial city for the family to be united in times of period. As the mass deportations from the provinces uh, quickly unfolded, she was doomed to die. Crammed into a cattle car, they crossed the Hungarian border heading to Auschwitz. So on the map, you see the red line heading to the north uh, from Debrecen towards uh, Auschwitz. However, the train was turned to another direction, thanks to a series of coincidences and peculiar twists in history. 3% of the deported Hungarian Jews 
actually escaped being sent to Birkenau. Some 15,000 uh, people were transported to Strasshof near Vienna in Nazi annexed Austria, rather than to the death camp. The reasons are twofold and closely connected. Despite their genocidal aims, in the last phase of the war, the Nazis urgently needed manpower for military production. Besides, some Nazi leaders attempted to, to negotiate with the Western powers and were trying to use Jews as hostages who could potentially have been exchanged for material or political gain. Therefore, the story of the Hungarian transports to Austria is intertwined with uh, the history of the controversial Nazi Zionist uh, negotiations and the so-called uh, Kastner train. I, I have no time uh, to, to explain, but we provide uh, uh, details uh, about these events in the book. Arriving at Strasshof, the Jews were transferred to various districts of Vienna and settlements in the vicinity, where they toiled in various branches of war industry, agriculture, and uh, construction sites. Those unable to work were not murdered, and families were mostly allowed to stay together. Living conditions, uh, workload, and treatment varied, but in general, the situation of uh, Jewish slave laborers uh, in Vienna uh, was relatively bearable compared to uh, the situation in uh, other Nazi concentration and uh, labor camps. Many of the deportees fell victim to bomb raids, accidents, uh, hardships, illnesses, and uh, also some arbitrary executions, but eventually the majority of them survived the war. Yellow Star, Red Star, Agnes's uh, Odyssey provides us with an exceptional perspective, even within uh, this uh, very specific story. She was among the very few Hungarian Jewish children in the provinces spared from the gas chambers. Even her parents and most of her female relatives uh, survived. Nevertheless, the family suffered devastating blow by the loss of young men, uncles and husbands who perished in the labor service uh, in the Soviet front. Agnes's family lost nearly all men, but her father who influenced her childhood years. After the war, she re-entered the Hungarian society and shared the hope of many young survivors for a new beginning. They expected that the system replacing the authoritarian and nationalistic regime would ensure them a normal life. However, instead of freedom, old anti-Semitism and new threats awaited them. Living 12 years in the shadow of uh, Nazism, she soon faced another type of tyranny. In the Eastern parts of Europe, as you know, behind Soviet lines, a new chapter of suffering began this time for both Jews and non-Jews. Is it my turn next? Yes. Um, may we have a picture, please, Cassie? Not that, this one, this will, no, 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 that one. Um, this sums up my life. Uh, against the wide tapestry of history, the testimony of a witness is just a, a single thread, uh, a, a my, uh, the single thread of my life, punctuated by historical events. I was born in Debrecen, as Laszlo said. Um, you can see when. Um, my childhood was um, overshadowed by um, uh, the Nazi regime. Um, uh, my, uh, can we have the next slide, please, Cassie? Um, yeah, that's me being hopeful, ready to start school a few days, just a few days after the outbreak of the war. May we have the next slide? My father uh, was a brilliant man, and he could have been taken as a template 
of what happened to uh, the Jews of that generation. He was first persecuted by the right-wing regime uh, because he was uh, a socialist, then because he was a Jew, and then after the, the war yet again, because he held on to his uh, socialist uh, principles. Um, I was a lonely child. Um, I had no playmates uh, because uh, um, uh, um, the Gentiles didn't allow their children to play with, with me. But I had companionship from my young uncles, as Laszlo said. These were professional men, childless and unemployed, um, because of the, the oppressive regime at the time. And they opened their heart and gave me their time. So they were my childhood companions. Maybe have the next slide. Um, this gives you the kind of uh, imagery which uh, accompanied my childhood quite vicious uh, anti-Semitic uh, propaganda. Um, and as Laszlo described, um, the, um, the German occupation was rapidly followed by the ghetto. Next slide. Um, oh, that's me. Um, I think my face shows you the kind of story that my life was like at the time. This is the Debrecen ghetto, my grandmother's uh, tiny home was uh, part of the ghetto and 13 members of our extended family gathered there. The youngest was two years old, the oldest uh, in their 70s. Um, out of this group, um, 11 survived um, deportation. Um, the, maybe have the next slide. Um, this is an artist's uh, uh, description of what it was like mounting the cattle wagon and be taken uh, out of the country. Um, uh, the, um, our train was the one uh, last load described, the unique uh, train which was heading for, for Auschwitz and uh, finished off, uh, fortunately for us, in Austria. I was 11 at the time, as he said, and I worked as a slave laborer among the adults in Austrian agriculture and later in uh, uh, Austrian industry, making anti-aircraft uh, guns for uh, the Luftwaffe. Well, um, um, when uh, uh, liberation came, um, that should have been the end of my Holocaust story, but in fact, I'm uh, only less than halfway through the history of uh, uh, my history, which is described in Yellow Star, Red Star. Um, the uh, liberation by the Soviet army was something um, I, I think uh, uh, worth, would be worth dwelling on, and I describe it. Um, then it took our uh, staggering um, uh, group of 11 um, a month to uh, move from Austria back again to Hungary. Why did we return? Well, because we expected to uh, meet up with our young men. We didn't know that they were already dead. We thought that we might find our home once again. We didn't realize that our home had been taken away by the authorities. Um, Budapest was Hungary, was a war-torn country, uh, devastated, there was famine and, uh, and disease. Um, this is a picture of the um, chain brid bridge in the center of Budapest. That's what the place looked like when we arrived. Um, uh, the, um, the situation was, as Laszlo described, uh, quite dire. Uh, there was uh, vicious anti-Semitism, uh, there was hyperinflation, and ultimately stability was established by the communist regime. Um, uh, maybe have the next slide. 
um, uh, the circumstances were um, a, a crippling tyranny. Um, our very soul was frozen. Um, uh, there was suspicion and fear. Uh, there were no choices to, make, to be made. Um, our book describes student life um, under these circumstances. And even uh, communist uh, uh, circumstances of uh, marriage. Uh, my marriage would have been a joke if it hadn't been serious and sad. Um, I did marry my childhood sweetheart when I was 19 years old, um, but we were determined not to have children uh, because uh, uh, the country which uh, uh, rejected its Jews, it also imprisoned them. This was not a place for uh, us to found a family. Um, we then um, took the opportunity of the 1956 uh, Hungarian Revolution, once again uh, a historical event punctuating my life, uh, to escape from the country. Um, the revolution broke out only months after I graduated as an engineer. Um, and uh, we uh, traveled across Europe. It was winter time. We never uh, received, we never asked and we never received any support from um, refugee uh, support organizations. Uh, and ultimately we entered Britain with a labor permit, um, this uh, um, the date was the 27th of January 1957, uh, and almost half a century later, the United Nations General Assembly designated the day uh, as uh, International Hol Holocaust Remembrance Day. Um, well, uh, my husband and I were well qualified professionals. We were engineers both. Uh, we were competent in our profession, but we found British society bewildering and very strange. It was almost agoraphobia that here suddenly there were choices to be made. We could decide where to live, what to buy, what to wear, what to eat. Um, the strangers, uh, next door and in the street were benevolent rather than threatening. In fact, I even learned in due course not to be afraid of people in uniform. Uh, we made our uh, way in society, in industrial management, and me as an academic, uh, I even got elected in due course to the lofty Royal Academy of Engineering. But most important about our um, entry into this country was that we could found a family with uh, uh, the confident knowledge that our children will not be persecuted for being children of Jews and foreigners. Well, so much about me. Now let me tell you about our book, if we may have its picture. Um, for over half a century, nobody asked me about my personal history. Oops, the other way. That's the one. And then when she was 10, my granddaughter Tabitha asked. We have a picture of Tabby. Uh, she's a bit older than 10 by here. Uh, she lost her mother when she was very young. And maybe that is what made her interested in her roots. And it might also be the reason why she decided to study theology at Oxford. Um, I, my friends became interested in my enterprise, writing uh, as a sort of uh, a chronicle for my grandchildren. And I was pushed, uh, encouraged to publish what I was writing. And that presented me with two problems. One, it tore open uh, the, um, the pain of the loss of my uncles. Uh, who were my childhood companions and lost in the military service. Um, next picture, please, Cassie. Um, so I, oops, that's it. I 
um, planted a rose bush. I bought a, a silver leaf for uh, Budapest famous uh, memorial tree with the inscription that this is for the memory of my uncles, but it didn't appear to be enough. Um, ben Barco, the, uh, then the uh, director of uh, the Wiener Library, suggested at my request that I should find a historian who could um, investigate further what happened in the military labor service. That's how Dr. Chess was introduced by Ben Barco into my life. He took a year's sabbatical and started to work on this aspect of the Hungarian Holocaust story. Um, I had another problem though. I was writing my book with uh, a kind of historical background without being a historian. And I was also recalling uh, memories of my childhood and my early youth uh, from a distance of three quarters or half a century. How much could I trust my memory? How confident can I be that I was writing the truth? Uh, I was trained as an engineer and engineers uh, were careful uh, not to put pen to paper about anything that uh, they achieved without being sure of their facts. And I had no facts. I had memories. Well, I started to research. I found myself a place in the British Library. I bought books and so on. And none of this was sufficient. Uh, I felt I needed the support of historians. I found more than one historian but not until I hit upon the idea, why don't I ask Dr. Chers here, who is a, an eminent Holocaust historian, would he read what I had written? Well, he did read and he was polite, but he was also very fiercely critical. He criticized my, oh, he was, oh, I, I must say, he loved my family photos, yes, but he criticized all my uh, other illustrations for being amateurish. And when he explained to me why, I realized just in exactly how amateurish my maps, my pictures really were. So he enlisted the help of the best experts in his country, in my native country, um, uh, his, uh, cartographer of the Academy of Sciences, uh, the best known expert in uh, photographic history, um, of the uh, Hungarian uh, National Museum. And so the illustrations began to sort themselves out, but there was also a conflict between um, my recollections of individual events and his knowledge, his understanding of the records of history. Now that's when we started to work together. I learned from him that uh, the historian's method of investigating known facts, known knowledge, but being ready to modify them in the life, light of new evidence was consistent with my understanding of the scientific method. That's the way scientists work also. So um, on, on my side, I began to appreciate um, the way historians worked. And on his side, I believe he began to acquire a certain amount of confidence in my sincerity to look for the truth, uh, we came some sort of reconciliation. And that is the, um, the result is the book which we have written, which is my story, but it is underscored chapter by chapter with historical comments, um, authentic, uh, presentation of the background. That's Yellow Star, Red Star. Sir, it's your turn. Thank you, Agnes. So let me just add uh, a few more words on, on, on it. Uh, so Agnes uh, beautifully explained uh, the route of the witness to find the historian 
and I'm trying to tell you my views uh, on finding a witness. Um, uh, as you might know, historians usually consider testimonies and memoirs simply one type of historical evidence, uh, helping them to reconstruct uh, events and getting closer to the so-called historical truth, if there is such a thing at all. However, the hidden value of witness narratives lies not so much in the reconstruction of facts, but something we can call the so-called subjective truth, uh, what, which means that even when being completely honest, honest, uh, witnesses can be wrong about facts, uh, but what really matters is their interpretations, attitudes, and feelings, something only private history can uh, reveal. As I was rereading Agnes's uh, memoir and our discussions uh, intensified and also I had a chance to me meet her, and uh, stay uh, with her in, in London for a, for a while during my uh, sabbatical year, we reached a new level on which we did not only cooperate, but we actually interacted. I first added some footnotes uh, to the text, then brief descriptions and basic uh, historical interpretations. Uh, and then I just realized it also influences my perspectives uh, on the events. My so-called macro view uh, was intermingled with her micro view and so-called objective stance with a subjective uh, stance. And of course, you can say there is not such a thing like objective stance and you, you might be right because uh, of course, no historian can claim uh, she or he is impersonal and not influenced by certain emotions, roots or ideologies. I was amazed to see the contrasts in uh, her narrative. Agnes's uh, private and family history uh, in Yellow Star, Red Star is written with outstanding veracity and pungency of a veteran scientist, which is clear, that written by a scientist, but also with great compassion. Love coexists with sincerity, emotions with uh, subtle, subtle analysis, peppered with uh, irony and a very specific uh, type of uh, humor. But this is not the only reason why I found uh, her narrative special and chose to use it uh, also during my university courses. Holocaust testimonials by their nature usually conclude when the threat of the Holocaust is over. However, Yellow Star Red Star goes far beyond the recollections of a Holocaust survivor. It is recommended read, uh, read uh, for those who are not just looking for another Holocaust saga but also interested in the hardships of survivors in the jungle of post-war societies in Eastern Europe, their ways to overcome trauma and losses, and how this experience could influence their value systems, life skills, and uh, attitudes uh, afterwards. With the experience of someone who uh, survived uh, these two tyrannies Agnes's memoir appeals to all of us to stand, stand uh, relentlessly against all forms of authoritarianism, discrimination, some of which surprisingly she even faced in the open society of her second homeland, which was uh, of course a uh, kind of new information even, even for me when reading the text. Agnes's memoir is not only a precious source of historical research, research or, or historical um, analysis, but also stands as a symbolic virtual memorial of the beloved men and women perished in the Shoah. Uh, this is just like the rose, rose bush she, she planted, but virtually, uh, but it's also 
kind of a cure for her personal loss and trauma, a persuasive testament of love, loyalty, and human uh, resilience in uh, extraordinary times. That was my that was my uh, conclusion. And maybe some something more about the uh, Holocaust memorialization, which is, I think, interesting when talking about this book, is uh, many well-intentioned uh, people say the memory of the Holocaust should be carved in stone. Uh, but as during one of our discussions, uh, which uh, I have to tell you, just uh, just uh, um, short uh, remark on our discussions. Uh, these are these prove to be uh, heated discussions sometimes. Uh, that's why probably Agnes uh, told my uh, comments uh, fiercely critical. Uh, it was not because we disagreed over some issues, but also uh, due to the emotions both of us hold uh, towards the events and uh, also has to do with uh, our temperaments, uh, of course. So this was, this was a, a complex relationship, I have to tell you. Uh, so sorry for this, um, this comment. So during one of our heated discussions, Agnes once told me, stone is a dead thing. It means for me that Holocaust memory should not become a lifeless, uh, rigid uh, idol, but a lasting lesson or message for respect of human dignity and equality uh, all over the world. It uh, also reminded me the famous quote from Goethe's Faust, I, I quote, all the all theory is gray, my friend, but uh, green is the golden tree of life. That's what I uh, wanted to conclude with. And uh, the floor is uh, still Agnes's for some some uh, remarks and... and mm -hmm. I want to tell you about the use of this book, possibly. Um, I uh, was um, confronted uh, with the comment uh, uh, by chance, a, a total stranger threw at me the comment that Holocaust um, survivors are almost extinct. Uh, he took me as uh, being still alive enough. And he said, it's your duty, your responsibility go, to go and spread the word. He didn't tell me what the word was and where I was to spread it. But he sent uh, after me at first the um, Holocaust Educational Trust, uh, who asked me to give two talks about my Holocaust experience. I did my best. Um, and, uh, but thereafter, uh, a lot of other organizations followed. Um, as you know, March of the Living and Beth Shalom and organizations in this country and abroad, um, old people's uh, uh, clubs, uh, schools, and so on. There was a whole succession of uh, uh, organizations in the last five years, uh, on the one hand, asking me for contributions, and on the other hand, made uh, films and uh, tape recordings of my testimonials. Uh, these all started, uh, these approaches, they all started with my experience with the Holocaust. But as I mentioned before, and Dr. Chers mentioned also, uh, uh, the Holocaust cast a big shadow over my complete life, but my life was more than that. And the lesson that was learned uh, from the Holocaust continued further into the rest of my life and the rest of people's life today. So here, let me just show you the kinds of groups that I, these are, are just examples, the kind of groups that I was asked to address. Uh, there was a, a, a big room full of 180 year seven students in a London secondary school who had never met a Jew before. And because they were 11, 
it appeared to me it would be worth telling them how an 11 year old survived the Holocaust. Um, what you will see from here is that I am an engineer. An engineer is a problem solver. Every group that came to, to ask me to talk had some kind of special interest or problems of their own. So if I investigated what their problems were, I could shape what I wanted to tell them to meet their individual requirements, as is the role of an engineer. So uh, there were a number of undergraduates uh, uh, formed a group of 60, and they were mostly historians or teacher training students. And they wanted to know what life was like under tyranny. Well, under, they thought under Nazi tyranny. And I said, no, 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 let me broaden this. I lived through two tyrannies. It was an interesting thing to try to compare the two, what the mentalities were of the people uh, who were uh, uh, imposing the dictatorship and how people survived under one and the other. Then there was an interesting approach from Romanian television in the Northwest of the country. Uh, they uh, wanted to me to do two things, give an interview and also a lesson. Now, if you know about uh, the circumstances of that part of Europe, uh, there is a historical conflict um, of the borders shifting between the two countries, between Romania and, and Hungary. Uh, the very fact that they asked a native Hungarian, once upon a time being Hungarian, to go and talk to them was a matter of interest. So I could uh, describe the situation, which, uh, um, which, which was the subject uh, of my talk, uh, against the specific things that was of interest for uh, um, the Romanians, that is Hungarian uh, Jewish history between 1930 and 56. Now, um, uh, totally different group was the Nottingham City Council Com Community Cohesion Team. Um, their very title describes what their, their uh, problem was. Uh, Nottingham is a multi-ethnic uh, city and they needed uh, to establish a team especially to try to smooth out the interactions between them. Well, I told them a Holocaust story and, uh, and another story under tyranny with respect to how that affects the minorities and how the minorities might interact in order to form um, a, a more coherent um, society. Now, uh, perhaps the most interesting group that I was asked to address was uh, year 10 and 11 students of an entirely Muslim school in the Midlands. Uh, more than half of the participants of the group I was to address were girls wearing the hijab. And I could describe to them my background, of course, but also how, um, um, what kind of qualities one would need to have, what sort of instruments one had to develop in order to overcome prejudice of any kind, in this instance, the prejudice against women engineers, even in a society as enlightened as British society was. Um, and um, in their case also, how to convince the family of their right to make their own decisions and choose their own careers. Um, the last of the examples, and do um, understand please, these are just examples I picked out of dozens of talks that I was asked to give. Um, the last one was a little group of um, youngsters, uh, 12, 13 years old, uh, would be Nazis. They uh, smeared uh, swastikas over the walls of their school. They um, uh, tormented and tried to bully uh, a few black and uh, the only Jewish boy in the entire school and the school thought that I might be able to help them. I talked to them, um, I tried to understand what made them act as they did 
Um, and uh, I found it uh, quite revealing that at the end of our conversation, one of them with tears in his eyes said, when are you coming back to talk to us again? Now, uh, all this relates to our book. When I first started, now five years ago, to meet with groups and talk to them about tyrannies and, and whatever, the Holocaust, this book did not yet exist, but my message did. And I was asked repeatedly, where can they read more? I am now in a position to be able to say, well, read this book. It's about the Holocaust. It's about overcoming tyranny, but it is mostly about the message of respect and, uh, and uh, honoring the right or to individuals to be themselves. Um, well, that's really all I was going to say. I hope you have some comments and questions. Agnes, there's a lot of questions coming in and um, you'll be pleased to know for both of you. Um, so thank you for that presentation. I'm gonna try and go through some of these questions. We might not get to all of them and the ones that we don't, I will submit to them separately. Um, but Agnes, um, can you stop, well, I guess for both of you, Agnes and Dr. Church, um, how did you compare your witness memory in a historian's research, but more specifically, how did you tackle any conflicts and disagreements that you had? And do you have an example of this? Um, you or me, Lati? Well, uh, let, let me... I think you... Go on. Uh, just, just go... Uh, you are, uh, yeah, you are mute. I said, just go on. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, sure? uh, you can, you I, can I want, to, I want to, uh, to give you just two examples. One is the way in which I myself tried to validate my stories. And you can read that. It, uh, there are a couple of examples in the book. That was before I started working with Lotsi. Uh, how I researched through, um, in, in, in the case of, uh, there is a particular in incident, when uh, we survived uh, a bombing uh, of uh, uh, crossing a bridge over, we didn't even know what the river was, it turns out to be the Danube, uh, there was a bombing raid and we survived it under dramatic circumstances described in my book. Well, do I remember it? Or did I see something like this uh, in a film? I was just turned 12 at the time. How could I believe that it really happened? Uh, well, um, I uh, consulted meteorological um, records. I consulted the history of bomb raids uh, uh, in and around Vienna, um, and so on and so forth. And ultimately, step by step, I proved in the book how it had to be at the place, at the time, at a particular date. And I could confidently say, here it is, I remember it, and that's what happened. When we came to work together, it was a bit more difficult. For example, I write uh, feeling, with feeling, with, with uh, conviction, that a whole generation of young Hungarian Jews were wiped out by those, that, that period by the Nazis. And Dr. Chos comes along and he says over half of them survived. Well now, this is for me a painful thing. I say, look at that. These are the names, these are the people. These are the, their birth certificates, their school records. And so these are people who were part of my life. They all died. How can you say half of them survived? Well, you go on. This is, of course, uh, uh, an example of the differences of uh, macro history and micro history, as I have already uh, explained. And uh, also uh, the question of truth. That, of course, uh, Agnes's narrative was, was, uh, was right. But still, if we see the border, broader picture of the history of labor service uh, over the course of the war, uh, there were periods when it was uh, deadly and the periods when it was less deadly. 
And paradoxically, when uh, the Hungarian Jews were deported to Auschwitz, uh, labor service, the deadly anti-Semitic institution provided an avenue for rescue because those who were in the labor service were not deported. So that's uh, another uh, proof that uh, history is a very complex uh, uh, issue. There are lots of examples in the book. Okay. Um Agnes, Daniel's asking, how many times have you been back to your hometown? What was it like? How did people react to you and your story? And did you experience much anti-Semitism? And has your book been received in Hungary and how has it been received? Well, that's a whole load of questions. <laughs> um, I was born in that country, uh, in that city, Debrecen, and I was deported from it, but I wasn't brought up there. Um, be, but deported from it because my grandmother remained there, although my family moved away when I was very small. Um, I did return after the war, um, mostly to try to find, for example, um, the house of my grandfather that I remembered and my grandmother's uh, home, which was the ghetto. Um, my grandfather's uh, house was demolished. Instead, there, there stood a uh, uh, a concrete block of flats. Um, Lati knows the city well, uh, Dr. Chus, uh, he knows the address. Uh, it was the whole district was demolished. My grandmother's uh, uh, house, uh, it was not her house, but it, the, where her, her uh, home was, uh, stood there. And I remembered from my childhood that there was a big courtyard and from the big courtyard opened a number of homes, uh, almost all of them Jewish homes. That's why it became part of the ghetto. Well, when I returned to it, uh, it was much smaller than my memory was because I was a child when I saw it. Um, I have no idea what the, the, the city's uh, population felt toward, towards the Jews, uh, the war, towards the Jews after the war, during the war, um, when the deportation happened. This was one of the great disappointments to us. This was a Protestant city in a Catholic country. And we expected the Protestants to be sympathetic towards the Jews of their city. Well, not a bit. They were no different from, from the rest of the Catholic population. Um, entering Budapest itself, which is where, where my family, my, home had been before, um, there was um, indifference or anti-Semitism. Uh, there appeared to be no interest, no compassion, absolutely no, uh, no warmth, nothing. Um, that again is described in detail uh, in my book. Um, I, I don't know whether we expected anything different but that is what we experienced. Okay. Did I answer your question? Um, I, I think the, sorry, may oh. I? In yeah, go for it. Uh, so I think the question was about the attitudes of Debrecen people today. Uh, so in short- oh, uh, Well, that yeah. may be up to you. I have no clue. Yeah. So, so, so you re you did return to Debrecen uh, uh, since the events, obviously, since your immigration to England. You have been to Debrecen, but but you didn't have uh, time to interact too much with local people. Am I right? Absolutely, well, I I don't, didn't even know any local people. Yeah, uh, and and uh, and the point is that uh, just to answer. Answering the question very, very briefly, uh, there is, a, I think, uh, at the moment, almost zero knowledge in Hungary about this book specifically. And as for Debrecen, and I don't think Debrecen is special in Hungary, but just giving you an example, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I uh, gave a lecture in Debrecen to a group of uh, 50 students from Debrecen and vicinity. Uh, who listened to my my lecture with uh, with, with interest and uh, and uh, and um, carefully? However, uh, they had almost 
zero knowledge on uh, these events, including the existence of a ghetto uh, in the, the downtown of Debrecen, which uh, was quite uh, striking uh, to me. Great. Uh, it's an interesting point to make. It was a major, major uh, Jewish connotation, uh, well, a, a major Jewish um, community existed in Debrecen. Uh, there was a Jewish boys grammar school. It was an exceptional institution um, of, of high standard. It was a great achievement of the Jewish community of the country to establish a boys grammar school in, in, the, in a provincial city. Well, that school was uh, uh, disbanded, of course, when the war came and it never reopened. Uh, the, the synagogue was... Uh, in fact, there was more than one synagogue, uh, but the Neolog synagogue uh, was uh, architecturally of interest. And there you are, there is the current population, Dr. Church tells you, don't know anything about the Jews. Um, thank you. We have unfortunately run out of time. Um, so first I want to thank you both for your truly insightful presentation. Um, if you want to hear more from Agnes, um, you are welcome and to- Dr. Chers. And I'm getting to Dr. Chers. Um, if you want to hear more um, specifically from Agnes, you're welcome um, to sign up for March of the Living and join her on one of our programs that's coming up. And if you want to hear more about both of them and you're interested um, to read the book, you can buy the book on marchoftheliving.org. I've um, left a link in the um, on the slide, and it's also where you can register your interest if you're interested in joining us on a Holocaust program going forward. Um, I also want to point out that Agnes has also just launched her new website. Um, so if you want any more information specifically about Agnes, um, the website address is on the screen. I am aware that there's been, I think, nearly 40 questions that have come in. Um, I will put them both to, I'm going to send a copy to Agnes and Dr. Church um, to have a look at. And I know some of you have put your email addresses if because there's specific things that you wanted maybe to ask with replies. So okay. I've kept anyone that's put email addresses or specific questions. I've got them all and hopefully um, we will go through them. Um, but I just wanted to thank all of you um, for joining us um, and thank you for joining the session today and hope you have a lovely day.